Dominic. Hello. Happy Comic Con. Well, thank you. How does it feel to be back? We're it's good. Yeah, this is a happy place. I was just saying that, you know, there's a lovely energy here that maybe for, you know, 51 weekends of the year, you're not able to wear that thing or lean into that fandom. And then for this weekend, even if it's not the fandom that you're into, you're accepting of everyone's fandom. And I think that's a really beautiful, positive thing. What is your, I feel like you're a Comic-Con pro. Like, what are your survival tips? Well, for me, it's kind of different because obviously for me personally, we were just talking, keeping moving is huge. Yeah. As soon as I stop at a stall or buying a graphic novel or talking to someone, that's when you get kind of in trouble. So keeping moving is key. Staying hydrated in general is always key. Um, and then if you're going to Comic-Con, planning out what your day looks like is is really important because you might want to go to a panel that is a 35 minute walk away and you need to work out like, oh, okay, well, I need to start walking now. So organizing your day is key. There's a lot going on. We were saying earlier, it's like Vegas where it's like, oh, it's right there. No. It is not right there. It is 25 minutes away. The convention center is huge. <laughs> it's just, it's a bizarre building, the San Diego convention center. It's like a weird combination of like a futuristic train station and a spaceship and it's massive and there's a huge amount of people in there. So moving from one place to the other is, is tough to do. I say you lean into it. Go to like the Rings of Power experience, re- lean in there and be like, what's this about? Yeah, we did explore the idea of me going to the rings of power but i think the word that came back was it may be a little distracting and pull a little focus and unless i'm actually doing something specific for that it might come across as a little strange so we're gonna avoid that (laughs) we're gonna avoid that uh well let's talk about moriarty the devil's game um i'm a big sherlock fan and moriarty has always been you know kind of the a villain villainy type character Um, but this explores kind of a different side so tell me how this podcast came about and what you were so interested in about it so I had been exploring doing some sort of show with Treefort Media. Um, we had thought about doing a podcast about football or soccer, as you call it, in the United States. And then it was we were thinking about doing it as a TV show. And that kind of it was in deep development and kind of fell off a little bit. And then we thought about what else we could do. And, you know, I, I said how interested I was in the world of Sherlock Holmes and, and different angles of that. You know, what we what we come to know very quickly with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's writing is the only person that can really contend with Sherlock Holmes in terms of intelligence, in terms of beating him at his game, in, in terms of staying one step ahead of him is Professor James Moriarty. So at that point we were like, well, what if we look at all these dynamic characters, but from the angle of Moriarty where he feels like he's been wronged? Because, you know, if you look at these characters in fiction or even in history, for them to do the things that they do, which objectively we think is wrong, they must think they're right. You know, they, they think, well, I'm doing the right thing here. I'm doing the right thing for me. And I think, you know, to explore that with James Moriarty is kind of fascinating. And now it's a podcast and uh, we hope to do it again. And at some point, maybe, it, you know, turns into a, a movie or a TV show. We'll I see. love that perspective that you just said, because like, even in my real life, when I'm like arguing with someone, I'm like, they think they're right. So let me right. try to like see it from their perspective. But even like, I like thinking about villains, like what they think is going on. Right. Like, did the Wicked Witch of the West kind of have a point? Well, yeah. She just like, she just wanted the shoes from her sister that she was crushed by a house. Oh, right, right. I mean, any of those kind of quote unquote evil characters, I mean, I think it's a little complicated to talk about real people that are objectively seen as being evil. But if you look at someone in fiction, like let's say, for instance, Voldemort, yeah. you know, he probably just thinks, well, Harry Potter's kind of, you know, behaving in a way that I, I don't like and he's threatening me and he's threatening everything that I represent. And he's clearly trying to attack me and he wants to hurt me. So I'm going to defend myself. You could understand how he would do those things. If you can't relate to these dark characters, then they just become so two dimensional. You think, well, they're just stupid. They're just, they're just dark for no apparent reason. Darth Vader, you think, okay, I can understand how he got there. And with Moriarty, he feels like he's been wronged crimes against him. It's obviously a complicated element with his with his love life and, and Sherlock Holmes is someone who is threatening his very existence. So we're, we're coming at it from that angle. You mentioned the other kind of iterations you'd like to see this take. So tell me more about that. What do you mean? You said I, we'd like to see a show. We'd like to oh, see. Right. Well, you know, I mean, look, I think it I think it works really well as a podcast. What's what's fantastic for me is being transported back to London in that time with the cobblestones and the horses and Big Ben and, the, you know, the clock chimes and all that kind of stuff. You close your eyes and, and, and you can hear it. But 
if it is so well-rounded as an audio piece, when you close your eyes, when you're going to bed at night or when you're driving your car, then of course that world can exist in a visual way as well. And I think these characters are compelling. I think the stories that we can continue to tell are compelling. There's more stories to tell. And, you know, we do, we are exploring this idea of like, well, if it's, seems to have found an audience in an audio form, then maybe there, seem, there would be an audience in a visual form. So some point in the future, we'll see. I keep wanting to say you're reuniting with Billy Boy, but I feel like you guys never yeah, we're separated. All, <laughs> we have a weekly podcast called The Friendship Onion, which we, which we do every Tuesday. So I see Billy all the time and obviously we're very close and, and we live in the same city, which is helpful, but we're always like in business with each other. So when this started to come together and, and um, Audible and Treefort kind of said to me, you know, we, we need your right-hand man. What, what do you think about Billy? I was like, well, of course, that's, that's a brilliant idea. You know, we, we know each other. I was just talking on this panel. As an actor, there are certain things that you have to do with new actors just to get along, which is kind of like, oh, where are you from? And, you know, how did you get into acting? And, you know, do you want a cup of coffee? And you Find know, your rapport. Yeah, just a little bit of, like, kind of shorthand. And that can be a little energetically draining sometimes. And the, the great thing about Billy is I know all those things. I know when he's energizing me or I'm energizing him or if he's tired or if he wants a cup of coffee or what helps or what makes him laugh. So that was really helpful. And uh, it's always a pleasure going to work with him. How did you find the voice of Moriarty? Well, I was conscious of like trying to not make him too posh. He's obviously from the kind of London glitterati. He's a He's a well-known person who, you know, has a relationship with the Queen of England and and is well-respected. So obviously he speaks correctly, but I didn't want to make him so exclusive in the way that he spoke that he becomes someone that you can't access. So I think probably I made him a little less posh than some of the other iterations of, of Mariotti. And again, with Billy, because Billy plays my kind of right-hand man, the, the kind of Watson to my Sherlock Holmes, if you will. Billy's character's voice is so grounded, like a grounded Scottish earthy kind of bloke. So I thought, okay, well, if he's if he's the ground for me, then I can be a little above him, but you don't want to be so above him that those two can't be friends. So that's how I found his voice. Speaking of the, the podcast you have with Billy, what is the favorite, like, favorite thing that you guys have unearthed about your time on Lord of the Rings that maybe you didn't initially remember? And you're like, oh, right. I think the thing that really stuck in my head, which is only a little thing, but it just completely like fell out of the back of my brain, is that Billy had said to me that on day one of filming, I had given him a card before we started shooting and he opened it and inside the card I had written if you watch my back I'll watch your back like love Mary you know to Pippin if you watch my back I'll watch your back love Mary and I was like what really and he said yeah and I was like oh that's interesting because throughout the entire trilogy I was always conscious of like okay I'm good how's Billy and if that was okay then obviously at that point I'd be like how's Elijah how's Sean how's Vigo how's uh, Orlando, but it, it it kind of automatically became this thing of like, if I'm okay, then how's my kind of partner in crime type thing? And and for that to have been captured in a card on day one is kind of interesting. And he still have it, or he still has it. I gave it to him. He still he has it because he's not sentimental at all. Bruce. <laughs> so he's probably like, oh yeah, great, okay. Love that. It's like, what do you do with cards after a certain period of time? I, know. I don't know. Yeah, I take pictures of them with my phone and then throw. That's them. a good idea. Yeah. But then, what do you do with those pictures? You're gonna die. They're all gonna get deleted. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, is it? What is it like being here and seeing Lord of the Rings stuff everywhere? It's a little peculiar. We were lucky enough to be taken out for dinner last night by the wonderful people at Audible and, and Treefort. And we went to Nobu, which is an amazing Japanese restaurant. And directly opposite from Nobu was a massive, like 100 foot rings of power thing. So I sat just looking at these characters for the rest of the evening. And I, and I kind of said to the guys, well, that's kind of weird. Um, it's strange to see it. Um, I wish it a lot of luck and I hope that it goes well. And especially for the actors, especially because I'm inclined to actors. I hope they're having fun. I hope they don't feel the pressure of expectation or, or from what had occurred with the Peter Jackson trilogy. I hope they just think this is a great job, made some great friends, hope that it continues and they embrace it because these type of jobs, you know, the jobs that end up being the best jobs that you ever do, they can disappear in the blink of an eye. You can be like, oh, I'm going to do this for years. And then suddenly three years go by and you're like, well, where's that going? And it's done. So I hope that they enjoy it and I hope they're having a nice time and I hope that um, it's a huge success. What sticks out to you about your, do you remember your first Comic-Con? Yes, Rings, yeah. With Rings. Fellowship well, of the Rings. Was that wild? Yeah, it was weird. Uh, we had done Ken, 
which, you know, got a huge amount of kind of critical and commercial kind of uh, brouhaha. And then we came over to Comic-Con after that. So we knew that there was like a groundswell occurring, but we didn't realize, I'd never been to Comic-Con before, so I didn't realize how many people were here. And I didn't realize how many people were here getting ready for this um, Fellowship of the Ring thing. So yeah, it was it was a big kind of feeling of electricity in the room. And um, you were acutely aware of the expectation and how how excited people were. But a lot of acceptance as well, you know. Uh, the, the, you, for the Rings of Power people, that entire auditorium will just be like, we really want this to be great. There's no one sat there going, nah, well, we'll see. Everyone's like, come on, we want this to be fantastic. So there's a lot of positivity, you know? Yeah, no one's in that room being like, sell this to me. Like, no. everyone is in there. They're sold. The energy is great. They, are, that, they oh. are sold. They know that world. They know those books. They know that mythology. They want something else to dig into after Game of Thrones or maybe alongside Game of Thrones that they can let their kind of flag fly with, you know? Uh, last thing I wanted to ask you is there's a book that just came out called Shadow of the Sith. And I'm curious if you've read anything about it because your character is really expanded upon in this book. I did hear this. I'm going to have to read this book. So a few people have told me on Instagram um, that that Beaumont, my character, features in the book relatively significantly and that he does a few things and, and has a, a relatively crucial role in it. I'll have to read it. There was, I was really tickled by the fact that the, a Star Wars encyclopedia came out after the rise of Skywalker and my character got like a double page spread and they kind of extended on his previous life. You know, he kind of had a complicated relationship with his parents and they didn't want him to go into the resistance. They kind of rejected him when he did. And then he became a high flyer in the university kind of, you know, graduating with honors and became a really intelligent code breaker. So I think there's a lot to that character. I love that universe. Obviously I would love to play, Beaumont again. I've said this previously and I think I got like in a little bit of trouble for it, but whatever. I think, you know, I think they're telling different stories with different characters in the Star Wars universe. And I just wonder if maybe after focusing so heavily on Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford and Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen, maybe they should quite rightly be telling stories from female points of view or from, you know, different people's points of view. So I'll just sit and wait. Where can we listen to Moriarty? You can listen to Moriarty the Devil's Game on Audible um, and the entire season's out right now and it's a real kind of mystery whodunit and fingers crossed we shouldn't be too far away from hopefully uh, doing a second season. Announcing season two. Yay, cool. Thank you so much. Thanks, good to see you again. Good to see you.